of uh, Paul Milgram actually learning they received the Nobel Prize. So let's just start with that, if you can all see it. Wilson, yeah. you won the Nobel, you won the Nobel Prize, and so they're trying to reach you, but they cannot. They don't seem to have a number for you. We gave them your cell phone number. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Okay, yeah. Okay. Will you answer, will you answer your phone? <laughs> You, you need to let them be able to call you. I can't hear you. Is this the the speaker here is breaking up? Pretty, pretty good news, and uh, uh, a pretty surprising way to learn about it. Well, <laughs> I made the mistake of thinking it was a political call, and so I uh, unplugged the phone. So then they called my wife's cell phone. But we had a kind of a comedy because Paul Milgram here, who lives just across the street from me, had turned off all of his phones and the Nobel Committee could not reach him. So I had to come over and knock on the door in my pajamas to wake him up. <laughs> so we had an encounter at the front door. Hey, Paul, you won the Nobel Prize. Great. All right, I guess that is it. Um, let me share my slides. All right, here we go. So, as uh, Celine said, uh, we thought that as an introduction for to understand auction theory the best way was to actually participate in an auction. So you will be put in the shoes of the participant in an auction and maybe you'll get to win some uh, amazing vouchers. So the participants in the auction will be you, everyone in the room is welcome to participate. And we will be selling uh, Amazon, Amazon voucher. Okay, we have three auctioneers here, which are Sarah, Alkis and myself. And Celine, of course, I guess, maybe we shouldn't allow you to bid. All right, and we'll use what is called a Dutch auction. So uh, before I, we move on to the specific rules, let me clarify that we don't give you any particular information about this voucher. We can just tell you that there's an arbitrary amount of discount that you can get, okay? Okay, the Dutch auction has the following rules. Um, make sure you understand the rules. The, uh, I will announce a price. If you're willing to take the voucher at this price, you can raise your hand. So you should have a button on Zoom to raise your hand. Maybe as a test, you can try it on now. Make sure, okay, amazing. All right, so now everyone, you can lower your hand. It's clear it works. Okay, so we'll start with everyone with a uh, hand uh, down. And as long as no one raises their hand, I will keep announcing new prices, which will be lower and lower. As soon as you're willing to take the voucher at this price, you raise your hand and the auction stops and you win the voucher at the announced price. If it turns out that two people raise their hand exactly at the same time or very close to each other, we'll use a coin flip to decide who the actual winner is. Um, I found the coin, by the way. <laughs> you have a count? Okay, perfect. So, all right. 
Is everyone ready to start? Okay, uh, I don't have a view on everyone, so someone else needs to check uh, who is raising their hand or not. So basically the, the, the first person who appears at the top of the screen, because the moment you raise your hand, you appear at uh, the top of the screen. So I guess that's how we will determine it, no? Okay, amazing. Are you all ready? Any question before we start? Okay. Let's get going. So the first part. Whoa. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Hang on. Is that a real bid or not? There's a few people with the, uh, their hands up. I think it is. <laughs> Hang on. Is it really you took it for 40? <laughs> so let's do a. Anyone has a dice, actually, it would be better than a coin flip. Okay, wait. Yeah. Two, four. How many raise their hands? Six. <laughs> so what are we going to do? Hang on. All right, shall we find an online dice or something like that? Something that randomly. Yeah, we need to find a way to find a winner. Um, yeah, they need to pay 40, by the way. So you owe us 40 pounds. Make sure we keep the names, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Sarah, will you be in, in charge of sending the voucher? No problem. Great. So, Toma, there have been some suggestions about how to break the tie in the chat. Since you're already plugged in, do you want to run this random.org thing? Uh, uh, or actually, look, since we have only 15 minutes left, maybe we can run the other auction and uh, break the ties after when the talk is finished. Okay. So, one of you, we, we have all your names. So one of you will have a voucher and will have to pay us 40 pounds. Let me keep going quickly through the entire thing. And let you know that you've actually won a voucher for 12.87. <laughs> a very profitable night for us. So that's it. We've made a lot. Um, we're very happy actually because this is a perfect example of what we call the winner's curse. Okay, so maybe actually one of the winners, do you want to unmute yourselves and explain uh, what led you to beat so high? And actually lose. Or not. Okay, so there is a standard theory for this, which says that because you only had limited information about this voucher, the best you could do is to try to form an estimate of the value of this voucher. Okay, so some of you, when you form an estimate with incomplete information, you, some of you would underestimate the value, some of you would overestimate the value. And because the winner is the one with the highest bid, it's very likely that you would be one of those who have overestimated this value. Okay, and so in a lot of these auctions in which the object has an objective value, which is the same for everyone, it's often very likely that the winner is actually a loser and has to pay too much. Okay, and this was really a key idea uh, where, which is at the heart of this Nobel Prize that was given this year, where uh, Wilson, the one we saw in the video, who was trying to wake up Paul Milgram was the one who first introduced a formal framework to think about this phenomenon. And then Milgram generalized Wilson's framework and tried to use this model to compare different auction formats and try to understand what in reality could help counter this winner script. Okay, and we know that this is a real life problem for real life auctions in which 
because people understand that when they win, they might actually lose, they tend to either underbid, which is not helpful to raise revenue, if this is what you're trying to do. And then sometimes people don't even participate into the auction, okay? So a big part of their work was to try to understand this phenomenon. And so as an example, this is a good transition actually to uh, move to a different auction format. Okay, so what we use here was a Dutch auction. We can also use what is called an um, English auction. So well, now we have a different voucher, okay, with a different amount. And we'll do the opposite, okay? So we'll start with everyone with their hand up. So maybe any, everyone who wants to participate, you can raise your hand. Okay, and now we'll announce a price. If you want to drop out, if you think this price is too much, you can just lower your hand. You have a button, lower hand, okay? As long as there are at least two participants, we keep increasing the price, okay? We announce prices that go higher and higher. Okay, and as soon as there's only one person left, uh, whoever that person is, will get the object at the currently announced price. Any question before we start? Are the rules of the game clear? Uh, okay. Just to add one thing, if you drop out, please don't raise again your hand because we can really, we can't monitor for... Uh, yeah, uh, so you have only one shot, okay? Uh, although there, there is an interesting theory for auctions in which people can drop out and re-enter again, but maybe just for simplicity, let's say that once you've dropped out, you've dropped out, okay? Uh, okay, here we go. So the first price will be two pounds. All right. I will raise a... Hope someone dropped out and re-entered. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, as long as we have more than two people, I'll keep increasing. Okay, I'll go maybe a bit faster than this. Four pounds. 450, five. Oh, someone dropped. <laughs> people really want this voucher. Well, I mean, the original people thought it was worth 40. <laughs> We're gonna make a lot of money tonight, huh? Yeah. Well, there's <laughs> two people believing in it. Oh, six people. Okay. The house always wins. That's the main message tonight. <laughs> oh, two people. Okay. So I'll increase a bit slowly now so that we can really understand when the price is final. Wait, you boy was one of our winners before, or potential winners. Wait, can I just ask, if I win, do I actually have to pay for this? Of course. It's a game. But there's, like, no enforcement, right? <laughs> it means that we're not going to take you to court, but you're not going to get the voucher. Did you drop out? So that's it. We have to okay, Helen, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations, Helen. So Thank you. You just won a 941 voucher for 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. <laughs> so we were kind of hoping that the English auction would do better, and in a sense it did. 
uh, the difference between the actual price and uh, how much you paid is much lower. But uh, we have to say that uh, the winner's scarce is still present. Okay, so here let's talk a little bit about two reasons why we would think that the English auction would help uh, counteract the winner's scarce. Okay, so the first thing is that you take much less of a risk when you're bidding in the English auction because you know that. You know, when you're in the Dutch auction, when you're the first one to speak, it's hard to tell for you whether uh, there is someone else who was just about to speak. And that was the case in this case, okay, where everyone spoke at the same time, actually. Or if the next bidder had a much lower value than you, and you could have waited a bit longer before you uh, um, uh, raise your hand. Okay, in the English auction, you know exactly who is left, and you know that you just have to wait up until the price is too high for you. Okay, so this has a tendency to make you pay less in general than in the Dutch auction. There is another thing is that you gain information in the game, which is very related as well, that as soon as you see that people are dropping out, you can start kind of reevaluating whether you have the correct estimate or not. And this is really at the heart of what Milburn showed, that information is transmitted, is transmitted much more efficiently during the process of the auction in the English auction, which is why you would expect that maybe the winner's curse is uh, less strong. Um, all right, so how are we doing for time? I think we reached the end of our little introduction. The, yeah, perfect. Any uh, question or comment? And then maybe we should say that. Do we have a definite winner for both auctions? Did we find for the first? Oh, we still need to break the ties. Can someone, do you want to do it? Okay. Well, we need somehow, okay. What was this suggestion in the chat? Yeah, I'm a bit lost in the chat, sorry. There was this random name. Mm. So the website random.org generates a random number within a defined range. So if you have written down the people who qualify, you could just give the numbers and run that once. Yeah, that's the problem. I didn't write them down. <laughs> and we can definitely draw a random number from one to six. The point, there was another link suggested, which was about names. So we can just put the names there. Uh, you can just ask Siri to roll a dice, I think. I don't have Siri, unfortunately, so, <laughs> but yeah, can you? Wait, I have it on my laptop. Hey, can you throw a die? She's not responding. <laughs> it can go pretty terribly. Um, but we really need a winner, actually, because the the, um, the vouchers are real, contrary to what some people think uh, in the chat. <sighs> okay, I'm close to giving up. Can someone from the audience who has a, a Siri ask her to throw a dice? A die? So we need to allocate numbers to... Yeah, yeah, let's do that. So who were the six winners? Raise your hand again. Okay, Yubo, very aggressive bidder. Team number one. Then Helen again. Who else? There were four more people. They heard they heard about the loss they're making and they're backing out now. All right, so we can we can do it by a coin flip. Okay, so you boys uh, the queen, okay, and Helen is uh, the other side. 
All right. Okay. It's the other side. So Helen won. So you got two, okay. But it, it, it's not compensating for the loss though. <laughs> But I don't know if you want to win it or lose it, actually, in this uh, coin flip. Okay. All right, Helen, I guess uh, uh, you want two vouchers. And I get maybe now is the time to announce that you will not owe us anything. You can just get the vouchers uh, for free. Congratulations. That's exactly what I predicted. That's why I kept my hand up like the whole time. And yet, uh, Lady Luck didn't give you uh, the, any of the vouchers, unfortunately. Many messages tonight. Okay, are we ready for the main act? Yeah, I mean, I hope this gave us an, a good uh, introduction to auction theory, okay? The key lesson is that really this is a game in which you have to be strategic and understand what kind of information you have about what is for sale and what kind of information other people around you have as well. And there is a lot, a lot of game theoretic analysis that is necessary to understand. Let's say one thing, Yubo's attitude towards the game was actually very interesting because he didn't believe we had the commitment to enforce payment. So that's another message uh, hey, Sorry. for Sorry. auction design as well. All right, guys, so Paul Milgram is in the group chat. So, sorry, he's in the waiting room. So I'm gonna request that everyone mute themselves so he has time to get set up. Sorry for interrupting Thomas, but we will be moving on to the next part of our talk, which is very exciting. Hello, Dr. Milgram. Yeah, hi. Brilliant. Lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for coming here today. Pleasure. How are you? Doing well, thanks. We're all incredibly excited to hear what you have to say. Oh, that's very generous of you. Hello. <laughs> so. Great. I'm just going to do a quick introduction. So, I mean, I think everyone knows what's up, but in okay. the spirit of Sen. Um, so for everyone here, moving on to the second part of our day today. So we'll, we're joined by Dr. Paul Milgram, who is here to talk about his work. The talk will be approximately 40 minutes with a 20 minute Q&A at the end. If you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat or raise your hand during the actual session. So Dr. Paul Milgram was awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences last year, 2020, along with, with his colleague, Robert Wilson. We watched the video earlier this, in, this evening. And this was for improvements to auction theory and invention, inventions of new auction formats. So, with that, Dr. Milgram, feel free to take it away. Okay, well, good. I was hoping I was signing on a few minutes early, but I'm ready to go. So um, th this talk isn't just about my own work. I wasn't sure what background people had, so I decided to set some context for it. And um, I am going to share a screen here in a moment. Let's see. First of all, I should... Uh, this screen into, oops. Here we go. I'm going to talk to you about um, truthful auctions, and I, I'm going to talk about a particular application of it that I worked on, which was um, uh, one of the proudest things I've done in my career. So. Uh, but first, um, uh, let's talk about truthful auctions uh, more generally. So uh, what do I mean by truthful auctions? Well, uh, informally, uh, an auction is truthful if no better, bidder can ever increase its payoff by uh, reporting falsely or behaving in a way that's other than straightforward. So if you imagine a sealed bid auction, I ask you, what's the thing worth to you? And it's gonna be in your interest to tell me the truth. Such auctions make it easier for bidders and have been widely used, for example, in internet advertising and, and some other applications, sometimes in spectrum auctions too. So the, uh, in the simplest auction model, and again, this is sort of by way of background, you have a single item for sale, you've got N bidders, 
you've got an item that's worth uh, visa ben to bid her in and the bidder would prefer to buy uh, if the price is no more than VN, would prefer not to buy at any, uh, at any price above VN, and uh, the winning bidder prefers to pay uh, the lowest possible price. So um, again, just by way of a reminder, I'm hoping most of you have seen this stuff before. Um, a game in strategic form is a triple uh, that consists of three things. There's the first is the set of players, N, uh, the second is the set of strategy profiles, S, where um, S is uh, a profile. It, it specifies a strategy for each of the bidders. And the third is a mapping from strategy profiles to payoffs that says as a function of what everybody does, uh, what payoff they get in the game. So this is the, the general form for uh, strategic games. And uh, in a game, a strategy is said to be dominant if it maximizes her payoff regardless of what the others play and if no other strategy has that same property. Um, so here's the defin formal definition of a dominant strategy. In the game gamma, the strategy S bar N is dominant for player N if for every profile of strategies that everybody else may play, S bar N maximizes the player's payoff and provided no other strategy has the same property. Okay, so um, uh, most of you have probably seen second price auctions. An auction is truthful um, if each player's uh, dominant strategy is to report its value uh, vis a vis truthfully to the auctioneer. And uh, a second price auction, which I certainly hope everybody has seen before, is a sealed bid auction in which the highest bid wins, the winning bidder pays the second highest price, and the losing bidders uh, uh, pay zero. So um, the, the second price auction, um, it, it, Celine, may I assume people probably all know this, the second price auction is a truthful auction. Um, Those who are taking some second year courses should be aware, but there are some first years who may not be. Okay, so let me just, let me go through it then. The second price auction is a truthful auction. Um, I, I have the proof down here or a sketch of the proof, but the main idea is this, if you, um, if you bid your own uh, a, a price equal to your own value, um, then you're going to win whenever the highest opposing bid is less than that. And, and that's the price you have to pay, and you'll be happy to win. And uh, anything else you bid, um, well, it might win or it might lose, but, the, uh, but if it wins, it's going to pay the same price. So it doesn't do better than uh, bidding truthfully. And if the highest opposing bid is, is uh, below your, uh, or is above your, your value, uh, then you don't want to win because to win you'd have to pay a price that was higher than your value and uh, you lose just when you want to by uh, by bidding your value and there's no other uh, bid that you can make that has the property that it wins just what you want and uh, and changing your bid never changes your price so uh, and that makes it a dominant strategy to report truthfully that's sort of the short of it and you can we can do it at greater length but that's the main idea now, um, what's more subtle, and maybe even some of the more advanced students don't know, is that the second price auction is provably the only sealed bid auction that has these three properties. It's truthful. The bidder with the highest value always wins, so the outcome is efficient. And the losing bidders pay zero. There is no other auction that has that property. And, and uh, one can prove that formally, but I'm just going to sketch you uh, uh, a proof of how that goes. And, and you can get into a much more general theory following this, these general lines. So uh, if it's truthful, it must be that uh, all of your winning bids lead to the same price. Suppose, uh, for example, that, the, um, uh, uh, that I, I can win by bidding 10 and I can win by bidding 15, and I'm supposed to bid 10 when my value is 10 and, and 15 when my value is 15, well, it, it won't be optimal for me to do that if bidding 10 and 15 lead me to, to pay different prices. So um, in order to be truthful, all, all my winning bids, if I win, have to result in the same price. And um, if losers pay zero, um, then it must be that um, I get a payoff of zero when I lose. Uh, it must be that I win when my reported value um, exceeds the price that I'm going to pay. Um, uh, 
and and it, if it's truthful and it's efficient, then I have to win when my reported value exceeds the highest opposing value, and it follows that uh, my price must be equal to the highest opposing bid. All these, uh, all this can be done at more length. I'm just sort of sketching how the argument, how one version of the argument goes uh, for you. Okay. Now uh, that was by way of background, and, and I could go much deeper into um, into truthful auctions, but I, I led you to that because I'm going toward the spectrum auction that I designed, and and I'm going to introduce that with something similar as with something simpler as well, and so this is going to be a, a hypothetical problem of an airline that uh, has overbooked a flight and wants to buy back. Um, uh, some of the, the seats. That is, I, I want to get Celine, for example, to say, I'll take a later flight uh, in exchange for some payment. So here's the problem. Um, let's consider this airline overbooking problem. I originally have a flight and I've got some empty seats on the flight and you can see they, uh, the people have occupied in, in first class some of the seats, but there's some empty seats here and in business class and in coach. Initially, the plane's big enough to hold everyone, but suppose that what happens, there's a mechanical problem and, and we have to substitute a, a smaller plane. Um, and the smaller plane doesn't have as many seats. So we're gonna try to move uh, people in, but um, we don't have enough seats to fit everybody. So suppose we were gonna run an auction and say, you know what, we'll buy, we'll buy this back. Uh, and we'll try to do it in a way that's efficient and inexpensive for ourselves. And here's an auction that I want you to be thinking about. Um, so I'm gonna start by offering $1,000 and I'll say, who would take $1,000 to give up uh, their seat? A lot of people would, okay? Uh, I say, well, gee, um, the, I, don't need, uh, uh, I don't need that many people. So what I'm gonna do and unfortunately, I've colored the business class people white, so you can't see them. Oh, oh well, okay. Um, so th there are some business class people over here too, but you don't see them. But I had more, I had more offers than I needed. So I say, okay, um, I still have empty seats in first class and business class and economy class. So suppose I, I offer only $800. This is a descending auction where when I have more offers than I need at a high price, I get to lower the price. So I, I say $800. And, now a bunch of people uh, go back, but there are, um, and you can see that uh, first class is full and I have a white arrow here going up for business class that you don't see. Um, and economy, there's still seats left over in business class and economy class, but there's no remaining seats in first class. So what I do is I say, okay, you guys get $800. I don't have room for you and I can't risk you saying no to a lower price, but, um, I still have empty seats in business class and economy class, so I'll quote a lower price. And a bunch of people go back, but I still have empty seats in both classes, so I quote another lower price. And a bunch of people go back, and now business class is full. So uh, these invisible people that you don't see, uh, sorry for my uh, color problem here, um, are now paid uh, $500. <clears throat> to um, which was the price they have agreed to accept to give up their seats. And, um, and they're happy with the price they've uh, received. But um, I still have empty seats in economy class, so I can lower the price, $400. Uh, looks, I still have seats, $300. I still have seats, 250 Now economy class is full. And these people have all agreed to accept $250. So I say, fine, I'm going to give you $250. And uh, now I have bought back uh, some seat rights in business in uh, first class, business class, and economy class in ways that um, uh, are prices that people are willing to accept. And that's an auction. And uh, if you check, think about it for a while, you'll realize it's efficient. The people who've agreed to leave first class are those with the lowest values. They're the ones who accepted $800 where these guys rejected it. The people in business class are people who, who've all refused to take $500 and the people who accepted it are the ones who are, and similarly in coach class, these guys are willing to take 250, none of these guys are. So I've, I've taken off the people with the lowest values and I've achieved an efficient outcome um, in this way. Okay, now, um, 
This, there's a whole class of auctions <clears throat> that work like this, descending clock auctions. And this is from a paper that I published in 2020 with uh, Ilya Segal. Um, and we have a whole class of these auctions and they all work like this. There, there is some finite set of possible prices that you might quote. Um, there is HT is the set of bidders who refuse the prices offered to them in round T. Um, H super T is the history of refusals uh, through all the rounds and uh, H, of, um, uh, H of zero, the people who have refused through time zero is just gonna be denoted by the empty set. Um, so this is uh, during the auction, this keeps track of the history. Uh, nobody had yet refused an offer. I made some offers in round one. These guys refused. I made some offers dot, dot, dot. Through round T, these are the guys who refused. So this, this represents the history of what's happened in the auction. And uh, capital H is the set of possible uh, histories. And a descending clock auction is a function that maps possible histories into price profiles. Um, so after, in, in round T, depending on the history in the first T minus one rounds, I quote some prices in round T <clears throat> with two properties. Uh, first of all, the price offered to any bidder in uh, N in any round is no higher than what was quoted in the previous round. So these prices are coming down. And the auction ends when no price changes. Those are the two defining features of a, of, um, a descending clock auction. Uh, subject to that, I can have any function at work here. Okay. So uh, why are these things interesting? Well, we can we proved in our paper these properties. Um, these pro these these auctions are are obviously strategy proof. So the what it means to be strategy proof is that you know if I uh, let's see I see Patrick there. Patrick uh, has a. Uh, uh, something that's worth uh, $100 to him. And when I offer 150, he can't do better than to, than to say yes. He says no, he keeps his item, it's worth $100 to him. He says yes, he might get more than $100 for his item. Uh, the worst that's gonna happen if he bids straightforwardly is you know, he'll, he'll get to keep the item for its value. Um, and if in the next round I lower the price to 140, it's still in his interest. Uh, in fact, and what it means to be obviously strategy proof is uh, this uh, concept introduced by Shen Wu Li uh, um, uh, in a published paper, uh, is that uh, not only is this the best thing for him, but no matter what everybody else does, the best thing that can possibly happen to him if he says, um, uh, if he says no, he, he gets a, a net payoff of zero, is no better than the worst thing that can happen to him if he says yes, he gets a net payoff that's always at least zero. So in, in that sense, it's obvious that uh, the thing for him to do is to uh, bid truthfully. These things are group strategy proof. That is if uh, Amia and Patrick and Celine all get together and say, gee, I wonder, uh, without making side payments among each other, I wonder if there's any way we can do something that makes us all better off. The answer is always no. And the reason the answer is no is that you think to yourself, well, suppose that uh, Amia, or I'm sorry if I'm botching your name there, or I'm doing okay. So if, if Amia is the first one who is supposed to make a change, she's supposed to say yes when she sh should have said no. Well, she can't be better off by saying uh, yes when she should have said no, because the price that she, best thing that can happen to her now is that the price is, is less than, uh, than her value, and that can't be an improvement. And if, if the change she's supposed to say is no when she should have said yes, well, then she's getting zero, and that can't be better than uh, what she would have gotten by behaving truthfully. So the, uh, the, the, whoever is the first person to deviate can't be better off. Uh, it can't be that uh, if you have a group of people that coordinate on deviations, that they're all better off by doing so. And that's what we mean by group strategy proof. Uh, these auctions preserve winner privacy, which means uh, uh, suppose that uh, whoever this is at the bottom, I don't see all of your names, unfortunately. Oh, let's say Thomas. Um, uh, uh, Thomas would have been willing to uh, accept 20 when the price was, uh, but he got a price of 100 
uh, he had took a price of 100. Nobody ever, nobody ever gets to find out that he would have gotten, he would have taken 80 and 60 and even 25. Um, that privacy is preserved. Um, this auction can accommodate budget constraints. That is, if I have a limited amount of money to spend, um, uh, well, I can always, uh, if, if the auction would have ended uh, with payments that are total, that are higher than that, I can always just continue to reduce prices. So if the hard constraint, if the one constraint that I need to satisfy is a budget constraint, I can just keep reducing prices until the total is less than the budget and, um, uh, and ensure that a budget constraint is satisfied. And this thing can accommodate computation time constraints. I'll show you what that means in a little while where it's, where it's important. Here it's, in the exa example I showed you was really simple. But if I have a, um, if it's hard to figure out whether there's space for somebody in the airplane, and I will show you an example of that, then the computation time constraints become uh, a real problem. Um, and the, uh, I can also prove that, uh, this auction includes ones, there, there, are, uh, there are functions P I could choose that nearly minimize the expected payments and others that nearly uh, maximize the value of the uh, people who get, uh, who get packed onto the airplane. So um, uh, these are all things that are proved in the uh, paper that I published with uh, Ilya Segal in 2020. Now, um, why am I telling you about this hypothetical airplane? Well, now we're going to go to a real auction, um, <clears throat> which is the most, uh, I believe this is the most complicated auction in history, um, most complicated resource allocation that was attempted by auction in history. And it's the reverse auction part of the US broadcast incentive auction. And um, I think what I'm going to need to do is, is uh, have you guys show it locally. This video, I was afraid of showing a video on a transatlantic line. But um, if you can share your screen and show this video, that will give people the background they need. Okay, sure. Um, I'll share my screen now. Is that okay? So I'll stop my share for a moment. I'm not hearing anything. Oh, uh, Sarah, you're muted. You need to play it with sound. Electromagnetic. Sarah, you muted yourself again. You have to leave yourself. Um, you have to leave yourself unmuted. The electromagnetic spectrum, or just spectrum, is the huge range of wireless frequencies used for all sorts of different things, from X rays to microwaves garage door openers, and baby monitors to broadcast television. Everything wireless uses spectrum. There's a certain part of spectrum that is particularly useful for various technologies. This spectrum is licensed by the government to different users so that the signals don't interfere with each other. Companies that run satellites, radio, mobile phones, and broadcast television all license different parts of spectrum. But what we want to really focus on is spectrum that's part of the broadcast spectrum incentive auction. The process for this auction begins in late 2015 and will involve the FCC buying some of the licensed spectrum from broadcast television and selling it to wireless broadband companies. Five years ago, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, proposed the idea for an auction in the National Broadband Plan. Congress authorized the FCC to proceed a couple of years later. And for the last few years, the FCC has been sketching out the detailed and involved rules for this first ever incentive auction. There are three interrelated components to this process. 
there's a reverse auction, where broadcasters will voluntarily decide whether or not to sell their spectrum rights to the FCC. Broadcasters will bid downward against each other to give up their spectrum. At the same time, wireless broadband providers will bid upward in a forward auction to buy that spectrum. Finally, there's repacking, a mandatory nationwide process where all broadcasters that stay on the air may be required to move to new channels. The FCC will begin the auction process later this year, with station applications to participate due by December 18th. The actual auction will start on March 29th, 2016, and will take somewhere between a few weeks and a few months. After the auction is completed, likely in the early summer of 2016, the FCC will announce the results and everyone's new channel assignments. Why is this happening? It's to really address wireless industry demand for Spectrum to increase broadband availability in the country and to generate revenue for a number of government initiatives. Because the difference between what is paid in the forward auction and what is paid out in the reverse will be kept by the government for these purposes. Who will it affect? In terms of the voluntary auction, nearly every station will get an opening offer to sell, but ultimately, the FCC is expected to buy spectrum in large markets, geographically adjacent markets, or congested markets where there are a lot of broadcasters. As for the repacking, that will be a mandatory nationwide process that could affect any station on any channel in any market. Okay, well, thank you for that. Did that show okay on your side? Pretty well, I think. Okay, well enough that you could see what was going on. Okay, good. So we're back to sharing my screen and I'm going to skip past this now. And uh, so I was in charge of designing this auction. Um, uh, the FCC called me to, uh, to help them do this. <coughs> and this involved, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this involved really um, historic challenges. The, the, um, <coughs> I showed you the, um, uh, the airline example because it's analogous. Uh, in, in the airline, you have a, you, we started with a, a big plane, and then we had uh, too many passengers and we needed to get some of them off. Well, here we started with a bunch of broadcasters, and we wanted to take some of that spectrum and make it available for um, mobile broadband, so we needed to buy back some television broadcast rights and take them off. Now, in, in the... Um, uh, in, in the airline example, it's pretty obvious whether there's a seat available in first class. You just, if you have a first class seat and uh, first class is not full, then there's a seat available for you. <coughs> but for there to be space for a broadcaster is a much more complicated uh, calculation. And this is where the uh, computation limits come in. So let's see if I can. Um, the answer is that uh, there exists uh, um, a space for a television broadcaster when there's a way to assign channels to stations so that no two nearby stations use the same uh, television broadcast channel. So let's actually, uh, yeah, so I guess we can go here. And this is technically what's called a graph coloring problem. So let's, uh, so here's how we uh, think about it. Um, this is a graph of uh, North America, US and Canada, really. Um, and uh, this, this repacking was done uh, cooperatively between the US and Canada. Uh, each node in this graph, each dot here, uh, represents the location of a television a broadcast station. And each edge in this graph, which is a line connecting uh, two nodes, uh, uh, are, represents two stations that, because of their locations, are too close or can't be assigned to the same television broadcast channel without, um, without creating interference. And they have a right to broadcast without interference. Uh, and so the uh, graph coloring problem, the traditional graph coloring problem says, given a graph uh, and a set of colors, when is it possible to assign a color to each node so that no two connected nodes are the same color? And here the question is, when is it possible to assign a TV station, uh, to assign a, a channel to a TV station so that no two connected TV stations are assigned to the same channel? This is a classic graph coloring problem. And um, <clears throat> it's a yes or no question. Is it possible to assign to each station in a set S um, a channel in a set C 
so that all can continue uh, uh, broadcasting without violating any co-channel interference constraints. There are about 130,000 co-channel interference constraints in the graph. It's kind of hard to see that just looking at the graph, but there are a lot of constraints. This is a large scale problem. And graph coloring is a problem that's NP complete. <clears throat> now, for those of you who haven't studied complexity theory in computer science, which I assume is most of you yet at this point, um, the, uh, the computer science has a classification of problems by how hard they are, how hard it is to create an algorithm to do them. Roughly speaking, what it means to be uh, NP complete is that in worst case, the amount of time it takes you to solve the problem is exponential in the problem size. You have to take uh, 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 something and raise it to the power of 130,000 to, uh, to get an estimate of the worst case solution times. And you don't want to take any number bigger than one and put 130,000 in the exponent. You get some really big numbers that way. Um, so uh, the, the, um, <clears throat> And that's, that's worst case. And that, what it means is that there does not exist any algorithm that we can guarantee will be able to answer this question in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so that's the um, uh, uh, that's what we get out of this problem. And we have to construct an auction in this setting and decide which um, which TV stations to buy. So um, uh, I guess before I tell you about the simulation, so what did we do? <clears throat> What we did is determine the set of prices and um, a way of setting prices for each station. And as we, re as we reduce the prices for the stations, um, before reducing any station's price, we would check and see, um, is, there still, is it still possible to fit that station on the air? And, um, if, the, and if the answer is yes, we reduce its price. If the answer is no, then we freeze its price. But there's a third possibility in practice, which is the computer came back and says, I don't know. I didn't have enough time to figure this out. And, um, and, and that's certain to happen for any algorithm that we, uh, that we write. There's, there are, uh, it turns out we needed to solve about 10,000 of these problems during the course of the auction. And, uh, uh, and, and there were going to be some where the computer would come back and say, I don't know. So um, what we decided to do, we did a lot of work on algorithms. Uh, Kevin Layton Brown was the uh, algorithm guy for my team. I was the team leader. And uh, he did a brilliant job creating algorithms that didn't fail very often. And so what we decided to do was to treat uh, an I don't know as a no. That is, uh, we decided that if the algorithm says, I don't know if there's space for uh, Celine Station, We'll, we'll say that means there's not space for Celine Station and we're gonna buy her station so that we guarantee that um, there's, uh, that anybody whose uh, station we don't buy really does have a room. Now there are other things we could have done, but that was the simplest and made the auction fairly simple. And subject to that, this looks a lot like running um, the auction that I showed you for seats on the uh, airline. The big difference is that uh, when we, uh, try to check whether there's a seat available for or, uh, for a station. It's a much harder problem than just looking to see if there's an empty seat in uh, in business class. Okay. <clears throat> now, um, I had mentioned before that uh, this thing is adaptable to computational complexity, and what I meant by that is the uh, when I say that the computer says I don't know, the computer uh, what the computer really says is. Uh, uh, I didn't have time to finish. You, you, you give it an amount of time, you say, you have a minute. And it comes back and says yes, or it comes back and says no, or it comes back and says a minute wasn't long enough. Okay, um, that's really what, the, uh, what it comes back and say. And you can set that time out <clears throat> to be anything that you want. So if you wanna run this auction in a reasonable amount of time and get reasonable performance, we can do experiments and, um, uh, and see how long it takes. And, uh, and we can adapt to any level of computational complexity. That is, we can put any time limit uh, at all on this so that we have an auction that runs in reasonable time. That's why we designed the auction this way. It's uh, adaptable to all of those uh, complexities. Now, um, the problem is computationally hard, and we wondered how well it would work. 
Um, and uh, we wanted to compare it to uh, theoretical auctions like, um, like the Vickery auction, a kind of second price auction generalized uh, to this setting. So uh, for computational tractability, what we did is we said, well, we can't actually solve the optimization problem for North America, but let's take the densest part of the country over here um, uh, around New York City and within two links of New York City. And it turns out that that's just barely uh, simple enough for us actually to optimize with. That problem is small enough that we could uh, solve optimization in reasonable time. And let's see what would happen if we ran this auction versus an auction that uses actual optimization. So the, uh, the Vickery auction, which is uh, the generalization of the second price auction to this setting, uh, we ran it on this problem um, using our, um, the computers in a lab at University of British Columbia. And we ran a bunch of simulations where we randomized what the station values were and, and uh, according to what we thought was a reasonable distribution and checked the uh, performance. And the amount of computation time that the Vickery auction took on this reduced problem was about 90 CPU days. For, for every simulation we ran, it took about 90 CPU days. And the actual clock auction we ran took about one and a half CPU hours. Uh, it's nearly a factor of a thousand um, in terms of uh, how much this, this is much simpler to compute than full optimization. Now you might think, well, okay, uh, simpler to compute, you're not going to perform that well. Well, we compared the uh, loss of value, that is with the stations we took off the air using the Vickery as, uh, uh, as an index of 100. And the rules that we actually ran for the FCC, which by the way, were not designed to maximize efficiency. We, we designed the pricing rules with both efficiency and cost in mind. But from the standpoint of efficiency, the, uh, if the value of the stations we had to take off the air in the Vickery auction was 100, then the value of the stations we had to take off the air in our design was 105. So there's a little loss of efficiency there. But if you take a look at the payments that are made, if the total payments uh, in the Vickery auction are normalized to be 100, the total payments that are made in our auction, which was, which was designed, by the way, partly to keep payments low and partly to achieve near efficiency, it was almost 25% less. 25% of $10 billion is a big number. Um, the, uh, the, we ended up paying about $10 billion to the TV stations. We think we would have ended up paying about $13 billion in a Vickery auction if we could have run a Vickery auction, which we couldn't do. So um, we, we think we saved the taxpayer uh, several uh, billions of dollars. Okay. Um, and that is, I guess I finished that a little bit quick, um, but that's what, the, uh, that's what we did. Um, uh, we created this auction that, uh, that was the auction to buy the stations. We also created a forward auction to sell the broadcast rights. And I mentioned, um, I mentioned budgets in the, uh, when I was talking about the theory. So let me just go back and since I have a couple of minutes. Um, one of the things that was important is accommodating budget constraints. So in this auction, the amount we paid the TV broadcasters couldn't, it, the government wasn't paying out money. It was, uh, it, it had to pay the TV broadcasters with the revenues that it got from the forward auction. So um, if you fix a number of channels that you try to clear and it costs too much, um, what do you do? Well, in, in, um, in, in our auction, what you do is you say, well, okay, we can't afford that. Uh, the budget's too high. So we'll clear a smaller number of channels. We'll buy a smaller number of broadcasters and we'll just keep reducing prices. And so we kept reducing prices until we reached a point where the, um, the total we had to pay to the broadcasters was sufficiently less than the revenue that we were receiving in the forward auction. Um, so that we could cover all the costs of the auction and the, the relocation costs and so on. And so this ability to accommodate budget constraints is built into the descending auction and we needed it in order to make this auction work. And again, the ability to, uh, to accommodate computation time constraints, it was a real-time real -time auction. We needed it to run relatively fast. And um, so we could set the timeouts to make it run fast. and, and 
fortunately for me and for the taxpayer, uh, Kevin developed really great algorithms. So we, the, the number of timeouts that we ended up having was on the order of uh, on the order of ten out of ten thousand uh, checks in the whole auction. So we he, he programmed algorithms that work really really well in this context. That was a major part of the effort of, in this auction was a tailored algorithm that would work well for this particular problem. And that um, that covers what I wanted to talk to you about. So that's it. And Thank you so much. Um, that was pretty interesting. We do have a couple questions. So um, I think one of the first questions we had was from Chloe. So Chloe, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I was just- I can barely hear you. Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if auctions can produce efficient outcomes. What are your thoughts on implementing this on a wider scale and extending it to private property? Perhaps a modern version of the Greece ideal of the auction in where all property, every factory or house or item you have is held in common and the right to rent and use it is constantly auctioned and the citizen who offers the highest bid possesses the object until outbid by another citizen. Okay, so that's a, um, that's a really complicated subject that you raised there. Um, uh, I know that, uh, for example, um, uh, Anthony Chung and Glenn Weil have written about uh, have written about doing this. The, the um, there's a number of people who have considered possibilities like that. The the uh, it's multifaceted. There's more than more than just allocative efficiency involved. That is, people uh, who have property uh, make investments in their property. Often, uh, the investments may make the um, you, you want them to invest efficiently. You want them not to invest in ways that reduce the value to others that uh, just so they can keep the property. You want them to invest. So, so the, um, the investment possibilities are um, one thing that's missing from the usual analysis of, of the situation you've described. Um, the transactions cost of running markets are missing from the, uh, 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 from the thing that you've described. Nevertheless, I think that there are uh, there are places where I think this is a really good idea uh, of allowing uh, easy turnover in property rights, and I think radio spectrum is one of those places. This was, after all, uh, exactly that sort of problem where we had a bunch of TV broadcasters or, that are squatting on some property, and uh, they had rights to it, and uh, we did need to reassign it. So, uh, Chloe, I, I think it's a great question that um, uh, I can't answer in just a minute or two because there's so many aspects to it, uh, especially the ones about investments and about the costs of, of, of running markets. But I do think there are places where a system like that um, would be better than what we're doing currently. Thank you. Sure. Amazing. Kieran, you have a question next? Uh, yeah, so thank you for the talk, Professor Milgram. Um, so my question was, um, given the largely uncompetitive nature of the US broadcast market, I was wondering, um, due to larger broadcasters having much larger budgets for smaller than smaller broadcasters, whether um, depending whether on these auctions, um, the larger broadcasters would gain a smaller Advantage, would gain a larger advantage in the bidding process from the smaller broadcasters. That would obviously entrench um, monopoly power and was wondering what the implications are for efficiency loss when considering market power and also if there is an efficiency loss, um, what would the implications be for antitrust regulation in terms of designing these auctions? Okay, um, so um, there's several things to be said about that. Let me first of all try to get the facts right. Um, <clears throat> in the United States, the uh, Federal Communications Commission has a uh, restriction in each market area, digital market area, of um, ownership of full power broadcast stations. 
which means that it, it's not possible, for example, for any uh, uh, broadcasting company to own uh, multiple full power broad over the air broadcasting stations in New York City, just for example. So the, uh, the, the big broadcasting uh, conglomerates might own a station in New York and one in Boston and one in San Francisco and Cleveland and so on, but they don't own multiple stations in New York City. And that's for the, exactly the kind of competition reasons you, you have. The, the, uh, the stations, if, if you own a station in New York and in Chicago, well, they're not competing with each other anyway. So the, um, so the first part of the answer is that. Now, it turns out that the, the FCC didn't do quite as well as we would have liked because there were, I, I, as I said, that was on full power stations. There were also low power stations. And uh, there were um, some hedge funds that managed to buy up multiple low power stations <coughs> to exert, excuse me, market power in the auction and make some money doing that. Um, the amounts involved, however, were trivial compared to, well, they're not trivial by any absolute standard. They may have made hundreds of millions of dollars um, uh, uh, of profit, but that's on the order of 1% of the value that the auction created. Um, the the uh, auction created so much more value than uh, that, that that was just, uh, you know, uh, there, there are clever entrepreneurs who find ways to gain the, gain the system, and you hate to see it cost hundreds of millions of dollars to the taxpayer, but when, when it's on the order of 1% of the value that's being created, you just swallow and, and put up with it. So um, actually, there's a lot more to say about that, but I think I'll stop there and see what other questions there may be. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, next up we have Shubhojit. Um, Hello, Professor. I'm calling in from India. Um, so I'd love to know, uh, as your career has progressed, the internet and new technologies like artificial intelligence have grown significantly, and they've become very essential to our lives. And they've also uh, fundamentally transitioned how auctions are run, right? So I'd love to sort of understand from you how this has affected traditional auction theory and how how you sort of think that internet and new technologies technologies are going to affect auctions going forward in the future okay so so um there's a lot of heterogeneity to uh, talk about and answer in your question you know if um if you have a house for sale um <clears throat> you know the and you want to sell it using an auction i'm sorry i'm having a congestion here <clears throat> sorry uh if you if you have a, you're auctioning a house or you have a Unique item, something that you're selling. It's uh, the the internet and artificial intelligence doesn't have much to do with that. The uh, people still need to come evaluate it individually. The old old fashioned auctions work just fine. What we're seeing is that there are some things now that we can do auctions for that were out of reach before. So, for example, in the very problem that I was just talking to you about. Um, we actually used artificial intelligence to design the algorithm that was used to check whether, uh, during the auction, to check whether it was possible to fit a station onto the, I mean, this, is, this was mind-blowing. I, I didn't know when I started this that this was possible, but working with the computer science team, artificial intelligence was used to design the algorithm that we would use for, the, uh, for feasibility checking in the auction. Um, the artificial, the, the uh, internet, and we, Google and, and websites decide which ads to show with auctions that run in milliseconds, um, which use, uh, the, you know, we, we can use auctions for applications now that they were never available for before. So the internet and artificial intelligence are expanding the range of auctions. They're changing auction theory by adding to it, not by subtracting from it. That is a, uh, there's still a lot of um, simple situations where we still use simple auctions. They're low cost. Everybody knows how to do them. Um, they, you know, but but there are new things we can do auctions for that take advantage of the new technologies. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you, Amia. Yes. Hi. Um, it's Jasmine. Actually, this is Amia. I had a question uh, with regards to the uh, the model that you just presented. So, 
uh, you explained that once we hit exactly the number of people that we want to put up on the air or the number of channels that we want to put up on the air, that's when we stop the price. But uh, for this to happen, are we assuming that, uh, or are we just using continuous pricing where we assume we will never have two bidders putting up their channel at exactly the same time? And especially with the fact that you just said that the program needs about a minute or something or whatever time you allocated for it to actually run, wouldn't it be possible that within that time frame you'd have multiple bidders putting it up where you'd have too much and then you have to sort of decide who to go for? Great question. Oh, lovely question. You can be on my team next time. So the uh, so I was I was simplifying the um, the exposition. So now I'll tell you what we actually did. The, what what I what I described to you was the theory. Um, so what we actually did was very close to the theory. Um, the, uh, we would um, uh, we would announce prices, and then we would go through and uh, treat the bidders one at a time. We'd go through them one at a time, so that uh, uh, I, I said I was going to reduce your price, but uh, but Andy went off, uh, uh, decided he was going off the air, and so I didn't reduce your price. In fact, I froze you. So the so we did this in, in sequence, but within each round, we did the bidders one at a time. Now that would still have been way too slow because if it takes a, if we have a minute timeout and it actually took a minute, that would have been way too slow. But what it, it turns out that um, each bidder exits the auction at most once, right? Almost every time when I reduce your price, you say, yes, I'll take it. So what we did computationally during the auction is we ran processing in parallel. If it, if it was going to be you and then Andy and then Helene and then Chloe down there, I would start uh, uh, checking for you. And then I would check for Andy, assuming that you were saying yes to the price and to Helene, assuming that you and Andy both were saying yes and so on, and most people say yes most of the time. So we were running parallel processing to drastically speed up the, um, th there were a lot of computation tricks. I didn't get into the computation tricks. We had a lot of computation tricks that were, uh, that were in this. But you're absolutely right. We, the, um, to assure, ensure feasibility, we needed to uh, have no ties. And we did that in the algorithm by, uh, by handling the stations one at a time. And a uh, really good, really good catch to pick that up. I'm impressed. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So next it's Henry. Uh, hi. Hi, Professor. Thank you for that talk. I think uh, you made a very difficult uh, problem, very understandable for me. So that was very interesting. Um, I'm just wondering from your perspective, like, um, so I remember seeing this video of you on YouTube winning the Nobel Prize in the middle of the night and answering that like doorbell. <laughs> so I'm sure you have like no regrets now, but uh, I guess like back in your 20s, ex ante to winning the, the uh, prize, how did you think about doing a PhD? Like, um, what were like what were you thinking of with doing with your life, and how did you know you wanted to keep doing school? So um, actually, I've been just been writing my Nobel biography, just thinking about questions like that. Um, my life was pretty random, actually. Um, I, I had an undergraduate math degree and really wasn't sure what I wanted to do and went out and worked for a while and then uh, decided that that was boring and I was going to go get an MBA. But I was, I was working as, um, as an actuary, working in the insurance uh, industry. And uh, there were some problems that they thought were hard, and I had thought about them. And while I was working at an actual, as an actuary, I wrote two papers um, for the, what was then the Transactions of the Society of Actuaries, a journal that no longer exists. And both of my papers won prizes. Um, and uh, then I went back to get an MBA, and I was in a uh, some methods class where. Um, uh, it was some problem that the professor put up that nobody knew the solution to. And I went in and told them how it depended on the uh, subdominant eigenvalue of the Markov matrix. And uh, he said, you're in the wrong program. Um, you don't belong in an MBA program. And, and uh, the faculty convinced me to switch into a PhD program. So lucky for me, I'm so happy that those faculty, 
And I thought about it. Yeah, I've always enjoyed it. You know, it turns out I enjoyed doing research. Um, and I sort of thought back to my actuarial career and said, yeah, I enjoyed doing research. So I accepted to um, switch into the PhD program, but then I had no idea what to do with, um, in the PhD program. And so I talked to uh, uh, ben Holmstrom, who's another Nobel laureate and was a graduate student at Stanford at the time. And um, I asked him, so what do you do now that you're in the PhD program? How do you, do? and he said, well, the most important thing is to get Bob Wilson to be your advisor. Um, so I took a course from Bob Wilson and he covered a bunch of papers in that course, recent papers, including one of his own that was about auctions. And I decided that, well, maybe I could uh, attract his interest by uh, generalizing his work. So I wrote a term paper that uh, generalized a, a paper of his own and it turned out un unbeknownst to me, he'd been working on that for a long time and he failed and he was really excited to see that and told me, oh, this is the core of your PhD dissertation. I graduated from, with a PhD in two and a half years, which was some kind of record time and, and um, that's how my career got launched. So it was kind of random. But I always, it appears that I always had, uh, you know, an interest in doing research and just didn't understand what it was and fortunately got some good advice along the way. Brilliant, thank you. I think we all appreciated hearing that trajectory. <laughs> <laughs> hard, hard to know what you want to do. And, and most of you guys, and this is what I tell my students too, most of you can be successful in lots of different ways. That's one of the reasons it's so hard to decide which path to take. Um, I was probably somebody who had fewer ways that he could be successful. I really, research was really um, a, a really a good choice for me, um, given who I was. So worked out very well. No, thank you. That's brilliant to hear, because I think many of us are in that position of thinking about what we want to do. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I think after we have Pontus, Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It's very appreciated. Um, so my question is regarding Nobel laureates. So uh, I've heard some arguments regarding how it can be bad for uh, discussions to have winners and losers. Like you have a school of thought winning, meaning another school of thought lost, kind of. Uh, what's your thought on this? Like, do you think it's a good idea to have Nobel prizes or uh, are you anti them? I, I think it's really interesting to have your perspective as you might be one of the most uh, relevant people to comment on this right now. <laughs> well, you know, um, I'm going to approach that from the side, if I may. You know, I always thought it wasn't going to be that big a deal with winning a Nobel Prize, actually. The, I, you know, people have talked to me about this for years, and I don't know. I thought, you know, well, okay, there's some money. That's nice. Um, and but the you know I teach I'm still going to teach I do research I'm still going to do research I'm still going to advise students why is this going to be such a big deal in my life and um, it's turned out to be a much bigger deal than I realized it was going to be um, it's just everybody looks at you differently the, the um, so you're right it it really does have this impact and some of that's good and some of it's not so good so the good stuff is that. I've had some ideas that um, I won't try to describe for you here today that people thought were too far out, too novel, and they weren't willing to try them. And all of a sudden, uh, I get a deeper hearing than I used to get from practical people who say, oh, okay, well, if you think so, maybe we should look at this seriously. And uh, I know that that's had some good effects. And, you know, my colleague, colleagues like Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who are Nobel laureates, are getting, you know, uh, good things are being done in the, in the world of development because of that. Roger Meyerson, my friend, uh, another Nobel laureate, uh, uh, has found that uh, in the political economy work that he does on nation building, where you, instead of every, instead of just being called a pointy headed intellectual and being the, the uh, we get more, we get more and better hearings for um, ideas coming out of the academy when there are people who are labeled as the people you should listen to. Now, uh, the labeling is a little artificial. I agree with you. I mean, there's a lot of people, I consider myself to be one of a big group of people, you know, who are in a rough equivalence class. And I don't think of myself as lording it over them, but you know, it, the, the world does. Um, 
I should also say, by way of fun, I remember my nine-year-old grandson, um, uh, you know, came back the day I won the Nobel Prize, uh, came back from my class and said, congratulations, even my teacher knows what that is. So the, uh, it's a very famous prize, right? It, and, uh, and it does affect family and friends and all the people around. Um, and, but, but I think the most positive thing is that uh, it allows some academics to get a deeper hearing than any academic would have gotten if we didn't have this labeling. So there are pluses and minuses, I think. Great, thank you. Brilliant. So next we have Patrick. Okay, this will be the last one for me. I have to run off. Okay. No okay. Um, make it short then. Um, well, first of all, thanks for the great talk. Um, with with many sort of aspiring researchers in the audience, um, and this will be a, a question popping up throughout the term. What's your idea generation approach? What's your what's your way of keeping up creating and contributing and innovating a field so that's changed over time when i was a young researcher like most young researchers um, i got my ideas from the literature i looked at what other people had done and wondered whether i could do it better or um, wondered whether i agreed or disagreed and um, you know that's where i started when i was younger um, I have recently been involved in practice to such a degree that uh, I find myself now thinking about real problems, like the, the theory I just described to you, which is the, a new theory of uh, these descending clock auctions. That was created out of whole cloth because we had a problem that was ungodly hard. You know, We couldn't solve an optimization. Every previous auction design has been based on optimization. Optimization was impossible. What could we do? And, and I was fortunate to have a great group of colleagues who were able to tell me what we could do, what the computer scientists could do, which is magic almost what they can do. And, uh, and then to you know, figure out how we could build an auction design around it and how we could make it simpler. So a lot of my recent work has been motivated by the problems that come out of real practice where I'm trying to figure out um, uh, a theory that will help us solve a real problem. So that's more recently. Thank you. And that's all I got time for, guys. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I think, uh, I mean, I'm speaking for a lot of people right now, but I think we can all say that we thoroughly enjoyed it and that it was quite the experience. So again, thank you so much. From all, all right. <laughs> thank you. I'll see you guys. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep, we'll be um, ending the call in a bit. So if anyone has any last minute questions for me, I don't know what you're gonna ask me. Uh, feel free to shoot or just hop off. Thank you for organizing this talk. No worries, I think you're walking away having profited quite a bit. <laughs> Thanks so much, Celine. Oh, no worries. Hope you enjoyed it. All right, pretty good stuff. Will there be a Sun Club meeting on Tuesday? Yes, there will be. And we are having Professor Zilabadi from Yale talking about education and its impacts during COVID. Whew. <laughs> All right. Um, Anyways, Thomas, thank you so much for the start. Oh, he left. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. How are you? Oh, good. Oh, good. Are we, I mean, are people hanging around? Or is I, it just fading out? I'm not complaining. Okay. Um, yeah, this was great. I mean, thanks for having him on here. That's very impressive. I feel like I feel like we weren't able to chat with him, so it was a bit of a factory line of like, come in, answer, 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 get out. <laughs> yeah. But whatever. Okay regardless i have to say yeah thank you so much for your question that was cool all right um yeah have a nice evening then and uh see you tuesday the latest i guess so enjoy online school everyone yeah. right <laughs> bye, bye Patrick. good night <laughs>